Okay, chapter one, the investment environment. And we're going to, uh, we have some learning goals in this chapter. We're going to understand the process of investing. Uh, we're going to talk about different types of investment, the investing process, uh, long term, short term investments, careers available to you in finance and investing. Um, let me just adjust this up a little bit title in there okay so what is an investment is is a if you buy a house is that an investment it is that a good investment or a bad investment it depends on where and what you do with it if you buy a house and then you you rent it out that could be a good business it could be a good asset good investment if you buy a house and live in it bad investment Oh, but you're wrong. You buy a house and then you sell it, you make a profit. Yeah, but if you take away your costs, the taxes, maintenance, utilities, you wind up losing money on owning a home. What's good, though, is you lose less money than renting. So, and you get, you do make some profit when you sell the asset at the end, and it does pay you back for some of the interest and some of the taxes that you poured into the house over, say, a 10 or 20 year period, but generally most cases over um, people who own a house take a loss if you factor in all the costs. If you're just going to look at your initial purchase price compared to your initial sales price and count that as a profit and a great investment, that's not the best way of looking at it. You want to add up all the costs of owning that house for that 10 or 20 year period. Taxes alone on Long Island you can easily pay $10,000 a year on taxes here. So in 20 years, um, with the rate of inflation on the taxes, that could be two, $250,000 you're paying in taxes after 20 years, which could equal the amount you paid for the house in the first place. So the point is, people realize, the people who are smart about their money realize that homes in general, if you're going to live in them, aren't the greatest investment. It's different than if you buy a home and rent it out or put a business in there or convert the property or somehow generate revenue from it, that's a better investment uh, because now the house, instead of costing you on a monthly basis, is contributing to you on a monthly basis. So that way when you do sell the house, that really is all profit because you've covered your costs along the way. But still, it's a low rate of return. A higher rate of return would be, uh, pe most people consider stocks one of the higher rates of return you can get for an investment over putting your money in a bank, having it in a house, Put, you know, putting in a CD or a bond. But basically, an investment is any asset um, which could generate a positive income and increase in value. Now, positive income is the important part. A house, unless you're renting it out, is not going to generate a positive income. It's going to be a negative income. You're paying money to be there. Uh, a stock that pays a dividend, that can give you a dividend, which is a positive active income. Even a bond will pay you a dividend. Some bonds will pay you monthly dividends. And then when you sell the asset, you have an opportunity to have a capital gain and make profits on the sale of the asset as well. So that's why you know, money in the financial markets typically do much better than money in the housing markets. Although you do have these anomalies where you have booms and busts and crashes and you know, short-term turbulence that can scare people. But by and large, you know, investing in stocks is overall a net gain for you know, if you're looking at just 10-year periods, typically, um, I think 19 out of the last 20 10-year periods, or, or maybe it's um, 18 out of the last 20 10-year periods, if you looked at stocks in 10-year increments, were overwhelmingly positive returns. So if you own an investment, you can uh, get income from the investment and increase the value. So you buy a stock in $10, you sell it at 20 and get dividends along the way. So these, so these are all benefits you're probably well aware of. And an, an investment can be, it doesn't have to be stock. You know what recently sold for $3.2 million? A copy of Action Comics number one, just last week, sold for $3.2 million. So that would have been a great investment if you had you know, purchased that book um, for a million dollars 10 years ago, it's now worth 3.2. So that would have been a pretty, you know, 200 plus percent return for something that's not a stock or a bond or a house. It's, it's a collectible. 
artwork is also a good collectible. So there you can find um, investments in a lot of different areas. Uh, stamps, coins, gold. These are all, you know, many different uh, assets you can own. Now, as far as securities or property, in securities we have the typical stocks, bonds, and options. Options we'll get towards the end of the class. They're a little bit more complicated. But stocks and bonds are just uh, tied to businesses or governments, and they are stocks represent an ownership, and bonds represent an, uh, a lending obligation. Uh, where you lend the money and they'll give you compensation for that. You know, if we're talking real property, land and buildings, um, buildings are, if you have um, an owner of a plaza or an apartment building, those are great assets too because they're generating revenue from uh, renting and they are, um, they usually go up in value as well. And it would be, wouldn't it be nice to have, own a nice, say, a 16-unit apartment complex close to campus? Maybe you specialize, it's a high-end apartment complex for, you know, professors. A lot of, get a lot of professors hired the first year they come. They don't know where to live. It'd be nice to have a nice high-end apartment close to campus. Or visiting um, some very rich uh, students who are going to be here for a master's program. Maybe they have the money and want to stay in something better than the dorms they provide here. Right? How many people here dorm? So, I'm sorry. But, uh... I hear, I hear some of them are good and some of them aren't great. You know. Like I was talking before, tangible property, gold, artwork, and antiques, collectibles. These are all, you all have, you have an opportunity for all of these to appreciate in value. But it's very difficult in collectibles and antiques to uh, know what, how much, you know, what's going to, yeah, what's going to increase in value. I'm sure a lot of you, when you were growing up, maybe you had, were you, are you guys, too young for Beanie Babies? Was that your generation? That was? Okay, so maybe you thought that that would be a great collectible. Or um, what else was, there's got to be some kind of cards, like Pokemon cards or something that for a while seemed valuable and it could have been a good, when I was a kid, you know, there are certain things you thought would be good investments and you bought because they're like comic books or baseball cards. I was big on baseball cards. And then I wound up one day, I just pff, in the garbage because they're worthless. Turns out having uh, all of Lee Mazzilli's Mets cards were not worth anything. Look Lee Mazzilli up on Google if you need to. Um, so there are indirect and direct investments. Uh, direct investment, invest, a direct investment is you, you own it a piece directly you initiated. So you own a share of stock that you bought a share of stock or you own a house or an apartment complex or a piece of gold. You're not working through a money manager. You're not working through uh, a money manager that would facilitate a group of assets that you're buying into. So a mutual fund is more like an indirect investment where someone professionally organized a group of assets and you're buying a piece of that. Berkshire Hathaway is like that as well. When you buy Berkshire Hathaway stock, uh, you're getting a piece of a company that owns many companies and many stocks as well. So that's sort of like an indirect investment. It's a direct investment, I guess, in Berkshire Halfway, but they have, it's almost like an indirect investment in many other companies though. But mutual funds, I guess, would be the best uh, example of an indirect investment. So if, as far as direct stock ownership by country, we'll see that there are, the United States typically leads the pack. Let's move this up a bit. Leads the pack as far as direct ownership, uh, with 30% uh, of households have some sort of direct ownership. It's even higher if you look at um, the indirect ownership, it's households with mutual funds and things of that nature. Uh, Canada, my friend from Toronto, you'd be number two. The uh, one thing I remember about Toronto is that, uh, you know, don't pay to go up to the top of the CN Tower. <laughs> Not worth it. Have you been to that island that you could take that ferry across that little island you bike around? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I would recommend that if you ever visit Toronto. The, um, okay, so Australia, Japan, Germany, and you can see that, you know, France is a lot lower in this list, but... Just a graphic to break up the words a little bit. Not that that graphic was terribly important. Now, other, uh, you know, attributes of investments. You know, if we're talking debt, equity, or der derivative securities, those are the three big areas. 
of where you can invest. Now, debt would be basically you're lending money to somebody. And they are going to take your money, typically companies or government, and give you interest on that money or dividends. And then pay the money back to you at the end of that time. Typically, those are a lower return type of asset than, this, than equity. And equity is another way of talking about stock. So if you hear people talk about equities, they mean stock. And that re represents ownership in a company, direct ownership in a company. Now, derivative securities, which we'll talk mostly about options, is um, an asset derived, it derives its value from another asset. That's why it's called a derivative. So, you know, a stock option is really a legal contract based on the price of a stock. And it, it has advantages because you can leverage them up very high compared to stock. Stock, you can only leverage about 50%, but with derivative securities, you can go, you can leverage about, you know, you can put 2% down and leverage 98% of the transaction. And that's one thing that was one good thing about real estate and, and, and a house, owning a house is that that's highly leveraged too. So if you wanted to look at the return, if you put $50,000 down to buy a $500,000 house, and then you wind up two years later selling it for $600,000, You're, you know, you're making a hundred percent profit or 200%. We'll go 200% because it's 50,000 investment. Okay. So risk, high, low risk, high risk. Um, risk is what gives, changes the level of return of investments. Very safe investments, like having your money in a savings account, which is very, extremely low, low risk. It's going to pay 0.025% of one percentage point. But having your money in a highly risky stock that may have uh, pharmaceuticals um, or bioengineering or solar or some kind of alternative energy stock or battery chargers or electric cars, these are stocks with high risk and generally high potential of return. So it's a risk and return trade-off. So as an investor, you're looking for something with the highest amount of return with the least amount of risk. And the only way to get that is to, you know, to find it first, because once other people find it, they'll buy it and drive up the price and the price will be a little bit more, uh, um, in, re in relationship to the risk. Okay. And, and investing can be in short or long term, short term securities or anything that's going to be less than a year. So if you had a certificate deposit for six months, that's short term. If you have anything that's going to mature in under a year, a long term is a maturity date that's longer than a year or doesn't end. You know, so a stock doesn't have a maturity date. It just it can go on forever. Bonds can have a 20 year, 30 year, five year maturity dates. Those would be long term. And of course, you can invest in foreign and domestic. And, it's, and since we're on Canada today, I uh, had some money in Canadian oil trusts back in. Do you remember in in the late 90s, oil was almost free? So these Canadian oil trusts were really, really, really cheap to buy. And I had just had this theory that at some point oil prices are going to go up because there's, it's just logic. There's only so much oil and there's a lot of people using it around the world. So this glut of oil has to be temporary. So I had made some investments. I had to wait 10 years though, before they really paid off because it took until like 2005, 2007, for the oil prices to really go up dramatically. Uh, if I would have held on to it even longer when oil spiked at one point, I would have done even better. But eventually those Canadian oil trusts, they, they um, dissolved. They were absorbed by other country, uh, companies or they just um, bought their stock off the exchange. So they're, which I thought would be a long-term investment, eventually they uh, disappeared as well. But what was great about these trusts is that they paid a 10 to 15% dividend a year. So I bought it based on the fact that if I hold it for X amount of years, I'll repay myself the money I invested in these companies. And in that time, if oil prices happen to go up, then I will make the a double profit because they'll be even more valuable because the oil and natural gas, they also had natural gas prices will go up. So in my mind, there was zero risk in this investment because the dividends would refund me the purchase price uh, of these trusts. And if stock, if oil prices did happen to go up, 
I could make even more money in the capital gains. So for me, in my mind, there was no way of losing money because even if, unless they went to zero or, or, or out of business within five years, that, and that seemed very unlikely because, you know, gas and oil was still a brisk business. It just wasn't, there's still money to be made. And let me tell you, Canada has a lot of gas and oil. Do you know like the shell oil that we're kind of pumping out of North Dakota? If you look on the map of the shell, we have like a third and they actually have two thirds of those reserves up in Canada. If they're not really up, they're not really doing the fracking like we are because they don't want to frack up their, you know, ecology and um, environment like we're doing. Do you remember, I remember they were doing a lot of fracking in Pennsylvania. And that same year, we had an earthquake, a substantial earthquake in New York, one August, like two or three years ago. And that was the first time I was in an earthquake. I was like, what is happening? And then they found out it was an earthquake. And I contribute that to uh, unscientifically and unproven, and uh, my very poor scientific credentials uh, leads me to believe that fracking was the cause of that. But New York State is not doing any fracking, so they're putting a, a hold on it because... They care about their environment. Have you seen those videos where they turn the faucet on and flames shoot out? They did two home box specials on that. Never saw it? YouTube it. Right now. All right. So suppliers of funds and demanders of funds. The government and businesses, they need a lot of money, especially our government. We borrow a lot of money. And our businesses borrow a lot of money too. We want to buy Tim Horton, going to borrow money. You know, all these expansions in businesses and governments, they're the ones who um, demand a lot of money. And that's why they're the ones issuing all these bonds, corporate bonds, government bonds, municipal bonds, treasury bonds, uh, and businesses issuing all these stocks as well as bonds because they're demanding a lot, of, a lot of this money. And where does this money come from? Typically individuals. You'd be surprised. You hear individuals have high credit card debt. They have high student loans, but they also have a lot of savings. Because they typically hold on to their debt, but they also save at the same time. So uh, individuals, uh, even though they do need money for housing and loans and college, they still do save a great deal. Yes. The interest rate on the debt is higher than the savings rate. So, but it's still, there's, they don't have the money to pay it off. That's the problem. So what is the benefit of whatever money they have? They have no money. They have deficits. So there is no money. The money, they're, they've raided everything. They took all the Social Security money. They've played games with everything. And they borrowed everything China has. And there's still no money. Because that's how fast we spend it. You know, the only way for our government to get money, everything that they collect in taxes has already been earmarked and spent. So if we were to pay off our debt, we'd have to borrow more money to pay off our debt. And then we'd still be in debt because we borrowed that money. On an individual basis, on an individual basis, people need like to have savings. They don't want to take their savings to pay all their debt off because that leaves them in a very vulnerable position. So savings is something that every individual needs to have along with debt. You don't have to have debt, but you generally do have to have savings. So a lot of people don't feel secure taking all their savings and paying off all their debt, being left with zero because they lose their job. Now they're on the street. Yeah, which should be, which most people should have a six months of. All right. Here's a little diagram of basically how the money flows around. So suppliers of money. Okay, so you have, we have financial institutions and financial markets. You as an individual can't touch the financial markets. You have to go to financial institutions. Brokerage funds, banks, savings banks, credit unions, insurance companies, pension funds. This is where you pour your money into. So every, as soon as you graduate from here, you're going to get a job. And you're going to put money into a 401k. And hopefully you put some money into a savings bank. Uh, maybe you have your own brokerage account and put some money into uh, your brokerage account. So these will collect the money. And they'll take your money to the financial markets. And in the financial markets, they'll actually um, buy bonds and stocks and treasuries. So the demanders of funds will get 
their money uh, from the financial markets through the and the financial institutions and supplier of funds are going to supply the funds to the financial institutions who bring it to the, they have the access to bring it to the capital markets and then that money can flow to businesses. And this is a good thing because uh, it gives businesses the ability to expand and take advantage of opportunities before their cash flow does. So this, you allow businesses to borrow money and expand and they can hire more students when they graduate. And then you can make more money and save more money and that can go to more businesses. And also governments can expand as well and governments can hire and governments can conduct war and governments can improve infrastructure. And so it's sort of, this is, this chain of events is what um, expands our economy. And it only really works though when workers make a fair uh, or, and decent wages. If workers don't make have enough excess income from their wages, then they won't be able to save their money and then governments won't be able and businesses to borrow it. So it's all dependent on having a thriving and productive middle class and upper class. Because those are typically the people who save the most. Okay, so types of investors you have uh, individual investors, which are just you and me, individuals who buy and sell stock. And then you also have institutional investors. And these are the money managers that trade in large volumes, work for insurance companies and brokerages and mutual funds and hedge funds and pensions uh, and banks, and they trade on the markets. And banks are actually big traders in currencies and trying to make profits in trading currencies back and forth. And so there are people who are institutionalized and pay, get paid to make trades. And this is the air potential potential area of employment for you that you could be one of these money managers or one of these, these people who work for these institutions who facilitate these trades. And they get paid very handsomely. And that's why it's a difficult job to get. They don't just hand those jobs out. Since the compensation is so great, you definitely have to start out in an entry-level position and kind of work your way into it. Um, now, short-term investments are less risky and more conservative. And if you have a bank account, you know exactly what I mean. There's no chance that you're really losing money, but you look at your dividends at the end of the quarter and you make one or two dollars. Didn't it wasn't always like that. For the longest time, savings accounts paid five percent interest. You know, and that that was pretty decent. And that's one of the things that's sort of a, a negative side of these ultra low interest rates is that uh, many savers, the individuals like us who save, we don't get the rate of return on the safer investments that we really should be getting. So that forces us to put our money in a riskier position in stocks and bonds to get more return. And in turn, that creates a stock market or a bond market bubble which a lot of people are debating whether or not we're in a stock market bubble right now. But if you, there's no place to put your money where you can earn a decent return, you, you know, you start moving it to places where there is return. And for stocks and bonds, that's where the returns are right now. So a lot of money is flowing into these markets and that's creating a bubbly situation in certain stocks. I wouldn't say the entire stock market, but there's definitely unique bub bubble pockets of bubble stocks that come and go. And if you look, um, Right now in China, they're experiencing a housing bubble where real estate prices are escalating quite quickly over the past five years. And one of the reasons is that you put your money in the bank in China, you don't get a lot of return and you don't have a lot of access to stock markets around the world or even the domestic stock market. So one area you can put your money in is real estate. So a lot of Chinese are investing in, they don't own one house, they own two or three condos and two or three houses, one to live in and two or three investments because that's where you can put your money. And you know what? For a long time and still it's working. The, the values go up and you can sell it and make a profit, you know, and they build more of it and you can buy new ones. They have whole cities that very, you know, only 10% of it are, are occupied because the, the, the um, demand for buying these investments is so great but the actual amount of people who can afford to live in these houses is starting to, um, to supply, the supply is not matching the demand. So that is creating a bubble situation that something could happen, we don't know. You know, the, since the Chinese government has more direct controls over their economy, they can, un, they can unwind this position slowly and avoid a big pop of the bubble or, you know, things can get out of control. So there, be interesting to see how that turns out. Okay, so the bubble is, the air is starting to come out. The question is how fast? You know, so it's a... Right, and they can control that by uh, 
putting money in certain areas to encourage it or, you know, so they have a little bit more direct control over their economy than the U.S. government does because a lot of what happens is out of the governmental control over here. So let's, um, for the world's sake, let's hope they unwind that bubble in a reasonable way that not too many people get hurt, you know, or give it a pause so that way the demand can catch up with the growth. Uh, now, common stock is what this class is mostly about, stocks and how to make money in stocks and how to invest. And um, uh, as we go through, I'll show you certain techniques I, I, uh, that are commonly used, that I use and most people use to look at valuing and, and determining what stocks to buy and invest in. And there are you know, many different ways to do it, but I'm just showing you the most common and obvious things you should at least consider before and generally, the more creative you are in looking at valuating stocks, the more unique you are, uh, gives you an opportunity to be very successful. It gives you an opportunity to be very unsuccessful too, but if you do it in a way that is, it's, a, it's a process that is unique to you and not a lot of people are using the same way uh, perception of the stock market, you may actually tie into something that could work out very well because no one else is looking there. So you're kind of getting there first. Uh, and um, hopefully I'll inspire you to think to change your perceptions a little bit to kind of enhance your stock ability. But like I said in the last class, the, um, I had to do it the hard way, which was make all the mistakes at first. Because um, unfortunately, I didn't have myself as a professor when I went to school to teach me what to do. So I had to make all the mistakes on my own. But you'll benefit from those mistakes. So you won't have to make them if you heed my warnings and listen to when I explain them to you. Okay, so common stock is great because we get returns through dividends as well as capital gains for the price appreciating on these. And we, you know, the one stock that got away from me that I'm, uh, every day I am um, so upset about is um, Chipotle Mexican Grill. I could have had that stock at $36 and now it's like $600. There we go. Um, or more, maybe 700. I can't look anymore. It's just so painful. I still love their food, but um, that's another example. I was talking last class. You go to a restaurant like Chipotle Mexican Grill, and you should just know I need to own the stock. Look how busy it is. Look how this food's awesome. It's so simple, the process of what they do. Uh, this is a stock I should invest in. And I had those feelings and thoughts. I just didn't act on them. And that's why you need to keep your eyes open and your, your financial stock buying mind active and open. And you go somewhere, you experience something that is doing really well, is a great new business. You should be asking yourself, is there a way for me to invest in this? And that's what, that, you know, these opportunities only come around once every so many years. So when you do hit on something, you want to explore it. And, and sometimes, in some cases, the stock isn't available yet, like Facebook. You know, we just, for a long time, it wasn't available. And when it was available, you know, even when it, you know, there's a point you could have got Facebook under $20 and now it's probably back over 40. So there are opportunities. You just have to realize, be patient is a really critical aspect. Don't jump in and buy something before you're ready. But in some cases you may miss an opportunity, but in most cases you'll prevent yourself from you know, buying something in an uneducated fashion. Okay. Other types of investments, of course, we have mutual funds. These are, um, Package groups of stocks, like in some way, either they're all from one country or one industry, um, or they actually they could be diversified as well. But a mutual fund manager puts together a diversified portfolio, and you buy a piece of that. The problem with mutual funds is it's expensive. There's a lot of fees: 12 dash 12b dash one fee, management fees, um, loads, front end, back end loads, uh, yearly maintenance fees. So they steal some of your returns. So if you, can, if you can create your own portfolio of stocks, you could save 2 to 5% a year of your return. So the mutual fund may show a 20% return, but you could have a 25% return if you did it yourself. And that 5% year after year really you know, compounds to, to almost doubling your invested retirement dollars by doing it yourself rather than going through mutual funds. Exchange traded funds are also like mutual funds, except they're, they're typically non-managed and they trade more like stocks. Mutual funds have a particular way of valuation 
and pricing, which you buy the price at the end of the day, so you don't really know what it is when you actually execute the order. Where stocks are and ETFs are, the prices are updated every second during the trading hours. So they have advantages where ETFs you can short, you can put, um, you can put options on. Mutual funds you can't do options with and mutual funds you can't short. So ETFs are a little bit more flexible. And of course, there's this mysterious yet alluring hedge funds. Everybody wants to know what, what, are, the, what are these hedge funds, Professor Nugent? How can I get a job in a hedge fund? You can't. They want mathematical wizards to work at these hedge funds, not you. You can barely do calculus. They need people to do advanced craziness creating a black hole or something like that and capturing that formula and putting it into the hedge fund and making money. So they, they typically hire a lot of science and mathematical advanced people and programmers to create these programs, algorithms, logarithms, I don't know, to uh, make this money. Basically, they put the math in one end, they crank the handle and money comes out the other. And... Um, This is the best way I can explain it. But don't worry, you can't even invest in them either. You need to be a qualified, you know, multimillionaire to even, you know, for them to even talk to you, to put your money in there. So until you're a financial success, these hedge funds don't even want to talk to you. Unless you have a million dollars sitting in a savings account or more, they don't even want, you can't, they don't want your five, 10, 20, 100,000. They don't even want that. That's like change in their pocket. So you have to be a qualified you know, investor of significant means to even be involved in these hedge funds because they typically like to deal with very high-end people, a small amount of very high-end people, and they take their money. And you know, what's great about running these hedge funds, though, if you know, they, get, they can keep 20 to 30% of the returns of the hedge funds. That's how um, these hedge funds, some of them around here, you know, the owners of them can make a billion dollars in a year. Because the hedge fund made, you know, five billion and keeping twenty percent of the returns. It's very easy to be generous when you make a billion dollars a year. See Bill Gates, a uh, uh, Warren Buffett. In fact, he, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have this pact with a bunch of other billionaires that promise to give away a majority of their fortune when they die to charities. Uh, Steve Jobs said no to it. They asked Steve Jobs, and he said, "Absolutely not. I'm giving my money away." All right. Derivatives. These are something that is a little bit more advanced for this class, but we are going to talk about options and, and the basics of future contracts. This is sort of at the very end of the class. Um, and of course, real estate, you know, the tangibles we already talked about. So this is just that charts in your book. Now, you want to get, in, you want to get involved in investing. You know, that might be one of your goals for taking this class. So the first chapter gives a very brief overview of steps of involved in investing that we continue throughout the course in the other chapters of the book. Number one, you have to meet the investing prerequisites, which means you can't be a loser. You have to have, you know, a job, cover your, your necessities of your life. You can't live in a van down by the river and think you're going to invest in stocks. It's just not a winning combination. You have to actually have money saved up that's, you know, going to cover you for your emergencies, your immediate needs, and then excess money. So you don't want to use, you don't want to get your student loans and invest them in the stock market. Because actually, you right now are making the, the smartest investment of your life, and that's a college education. This college education that you're paying for right now, well, I, I would say it would add up to, in my own estimates, not the official U.S. news estimates, my own estimates is going to add an extra $2 million worth of salary to your life by having a college degree, rather than not having a college degree and working at Wendy's. You're not quite McDonald's material. But you're getting there, okay? So don't feel bad. You're getting there. You know, some new clothes, a new attitude, you know, a smile, and you're, you're closer to that goal. But... Um, but anyway, $2 million, think of how much you're paying for school. That's a small sum compared to this extra $2 million in salary you make over your lifetime. Um, in fact, I didn't want to go to college. And when I was in high school, I got a job working in a factory. Uh, and then after three days of that, I went from being uh, a C plus student to an A student. 
In fact, the guidance counselor took me into his office and said, I don't really understand what's happening here. You, for two years, you've been a, a C plus student and suddenly you're pulling in straight A's in every course. How did you do that? And I just said, motivation. I said, if you saw these faces in the factory putting together these batteries, believe me, you would spend every, it haunted me. Every waking moment I was studying, I was trying to get my GPA up high enough so I could make it into college. And then because, and then every day in college, I didn't miss one college class. I was at every class. I was like, yeah, let's learn. Like, how can I get a job? And like, this is your first day of college. That's not a question to ask right now. I don't care. Let's, what can I do? I'll take extra classes. I'll read extra books. Just don't put me back in the factory, please. So I was extremely motivated to do well. And, um, and I calculated my salary versus if I stayed working in that factory for 20 years versus uh, my career. And, and yeah, there was, I won't say the exact number, but it was definitely more than I paid for college. Um, so anyway, step two, once you reach step one, you have the money or you have a job. The first most important thing to do, as soon as you get your job after college, you're going to join your 401k plan. And later on in class, I'll tell you how much to contribute to your 401k plan. And if you follow my rules for contributing to your 401k plan, you're going to have $15 million for retirement. But you have to follow my rules. And that first rule is you sign up to the 401k as soon as you get that first job and you're eligible. That's the first rule. Don't think that, hey, I'm 22, I'm pretty young, I can wait till I'm 30 to start contributing to the 401k. You just cut about $7 million out of your retirement by doing that. Okay, step two, establish your goals. Um, do you want to accumulate for retirement? That definitely should be a goal. Enhancing your income, how would you like to have enough government and municipal bonds to pay you $5,000 a month tax-free? Wouldn't that be awesome? That could be a goal. Um, sheltering income from taxes. That's a goal for a lot of people. You know, if you don't take advantage of your 401k, any money you put into that 401k is an instant tax deduction and lowers your salary and puts you in a lower overall tax rate. So that's an extreme motivation as well. So there are a lot of reasons to establish and a lot of different investment goals. Um, but you have to understand what they are. Are they very short term or long term? Maybe they're short term. You just want to save and invest, hopefully buy a car. And if you do really well, you'll, you'll get that Mercedes. And if you don't do so well, you'll get that Honda. But either way, you're using, uh, you have a financial goal to save up for a car using the financial markets. Okay, three, an investment plan. And these are things we're learning throughout the course, but you should have a plan. Anything you're gonna do that's worth doing, you should have some sort of plan. Just like your college career here, you have a plan. You know what classes you need to take, hopefully. And your plan, how many years it's gonna take you to graduate. I remember, I remember talking um, to like, um, someone in college when I was signing up and they're like, all right, how many years do you wanna be here? And I said, well, how much is my, will my financial aid and scholarships carry me for? And like, well, four years. Like, okay, that's when I want to graduate. Because <laughs> the uh, fifth year I got to pay for? Uh, no. That's why some students here are very adventurous. Anybody here taking six or seven classes? Raise your hand. Okay, so already you made, if you can handle that load of classes, you made a f smart financial decision. Maybe you can graduate in three and a half years instead of four. Save a semester of dorm fees and, is that the plan? Okay, whatever. <laughs> All right. After you have a plan and you can understand your risk tolerance, then you could think about evaluating different investments. So this is how much, this is my plan of where I want to be. And it, during this class, you'll be able to understand how much risk you'll need. Because sometimes if, if your goals are just too risky, that's not always a good plan. But if your goals have room for an adequate amount of risk, generally enough risk to compensate stock investing, then you need to look at what different investments in stock can get me to that level. So I'm willing to take some risk. I'm young. I'm willing to put all my money in stocks to save for my retirement, which you'll have much more money if you put your money in stocks at age 22 for retirement than if you put them in a bank account or, or bonds. So this is why it's important to understand the risk and return possibilities of different investments. And then once you've evaluated the investments available to you, which we'll talk more about in chapter four, then you'll be able to hopefully find, search and gather, 
the suitable investments for you. What investments are going to help you make this plan? And then you can construct a, a portfolio of this group of investments that you want to uh, think about. In chapter five, we'll talk about diversification strategies and some mathematical formulas for that. And then step seven, you manage your portfolio throughout your life. And you adapt and you change your portfolio as situation changes uh, in your income and in your employment and things of that nature. So those are sort of the seven steps you need to think about before you start investing. Because if you have a goal and idea of what you want to do when you're investing, you typically will have better returns than if you just dabble in it or just do whatever and not really think about where it's taking you. Okay. Now, a big problem with making money is that you have to pay taxes. You know, these are uh, the 1% problem, right? Actually, it's the 100% problem because everybody in this country pays taxes. There's not a single person in this country that doesn't pay taxes. Why? Sales tax. Everybody's paying sales tax. There's, there's almost nobody that doesn't buy anything. Any income you make is taxed. You may get some benefits from the government, but at the same time, you'll be paying taxes as well. So um, tax planning is a good uh, addition into investing as well. So if you could reduce your taxes, that's less money the government gets. And for, you know, a simple formula is if you put $100 into your 401k and your company is going to match 50% of that, that $100 will reduce your paycheck by about, um, six, by about $60. So if you normally get paid $800, your paycheck isn't going to go down to $700. It's going to go down to $740. But you're putting $100 into this fund. Plus the company is giving you another 50 so basically, a, six, a $60 investment coming out of your check from what you see creates $150 savings. And that's why 401k plans are important to get started because you don't want to miss that tax deduction and you don't want to miss that company match because it really uh, and instantly elevates your savings. Uh, and the, big, the biggest part of that is that it's reducing your taxes. All right. The way that you look at profits and the way that you try to manage your profits and your, your, your gains and losses through the years will also significantly affect your taxes. And, and we're going to talk. Um, one thing we have to understand is that the, our federal tax system is progressive. So we have brackets anywhere from 10 to close to 40 percent. Now, the more money you make, the higher the bracket you're in and the higher taxes you're going to pay. So that's that's okay with me. I don't mind paying a lot of taxes as long as I'm making a lot of money. So it seems to be a sort of a fair system. And for you as students, if you're not working, you're probably not paying a lot of taxes. You may even be getting tax credits for going to school and attending school. Now types of income, most of your income will come from what we call active income, working, wages, salaries, pensions. And this is income you generally tax the most. You can have portfolio income income from investments like interest, dividends, and capital gains. Uh, if you're really tax sensitive, you can just buy municipal bonds, which pay no taxes, to really lower your tax um, position. And there's passive income from rents, real estate, royalties, partnerships, and companies. So there are some passive uh, income where they get taxed. All three of these get taxed at different ways. Active income gets taxed the heaviest, uh, then Portfolio and passive income taxes are less, but it depends on the situation. And you know what's one thing that's great about real estate? You can buy a house, hold it for a certain amount of years, and sell it and make $200,000 on a house, and you pay no taxes on those gains. So real estate, if you, if you have the timing right, is a tax-free gain, which is a significant benefit for investing in real estate. That's something that they don't publicize too often, but right now, if you sell a house to make a huge capital gain, you don't owe any taxes on it. You don't even have to report it on your, on your uh, income taxes. Okay. Here are the tax brackets. You're going to ask me this. Do I need to memorize this for the test? No. <laughs> I wouldn't have you memorize something like this. But you can see that, say, when you graduate, you're sure to be in this 25% bucket, meaning making between 35 to 85%. So 25 cents of every, actually 25 cents of every dollar above 35,000 is what gets taxed at the 25% level. So the first $8,000 every American makes gets paid at 
10% you pay on that. No matter how much money you make after that, everybody pays the first. It's progressive. But if you make money above that 8,000, any new money above that 8,000 is at the 15%. Any new money above 35,000 is going to be taxed at. So 35,349, that last dollar, you only pay 15 cents on. But the next dollar you earn, this one dollar here, this 51, you're now paying 25 cents on that dollar. So it's a progressive tax system. Um, so we all get treated equally. It's just as we make more money, the new money gets taxed at a higher rate. And this is something in the next class, just, I'm not ending class as I said, but in the next class, we'll be doing that by hand. I'm actually going to show you how to have a certain income and understand how the tax breaks down. Now, uh, this is the last slide for the day. Ordinary income, active portfolio and passive income is considered ordinary and it can contribute to a um, being tax, taxed in the progressive tax area. Now, capital gains or losses will be taxed differently. If you have a capital gain and you, have, you don't make a lot of income and you have a capital gain that's long term, you can have a very low tax responsibility for that capital gain, sometimes as low as 5 or 10%. Uh, and if you have a capital loss, if you buy a stock and take a loss on it, so you say you have a $3,000 loss in the stock, you can deduct that from your taxes. So your actual loss may only be 2000 because the government will give you some of that loss money back as a tax reduction. So losses at the casino are permanent. Losses in the stock market, you get a tax credit for it. So it does help cushion the blow of, of some of the losses that you made. But there are limits on the capital loss as well as there are limits in the capital gain. But a, a capital asset, stocks and bonds, if you buy at a low price and sell at a high price, that's how you generate this capital profit. Now, okay, we're going to continue here next class. I'm going to leave a, a couple minutes into the class if people have questions that they're of a more private nature you don't want to ask during class. And I'll see you next Wednesday. Enjoy your Labor Day holiday. Take care, everybody. Correct.